In this video, I'll talk about vaporization. Vaporization is the transition from the liquid state to the gas state. There are two types of vaporization. One, evaporation. Evaporation may occur at any temperature. Two, boiling of a liquid. Boiling occurs only at the boiling point. But the boiling point of a liquid does depend on the external pressure. Under 1 atm pressure, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, but on top of the Mount Everest, the pressure is lower and water boils at 71 degrees Celsius. I made a video about the relationship between the boiling point and the elevation. So there's 1 degree Celsius boiling point decrease per 1000 feet elevation. For example, the elevation of Ellensburg is 1,500 feet. Therefore, the boiling point of water is 1.5 lower than 100 degrees Celsius. Therefore, we know the boiling point of water in Ellensburg is roughly 95.5, 98.5 degrees Celsius. And now you can actually estimate the elevation of Mount Everest. So 71 is 29 lower than 100. Therefore, the elevation of Mount Everest is 29,000 feet. You may watch this video to understand the vaporization at the molecular level. It's a six minute video. So as we add heat to water, the water molecules begin moving faster and some of them spread out and form a gas. We call that gas water vapor. And that's what's inside the bubbles you see. These bubbles rise to the surface, and this is what we call boiling. So we'll start with the water molecule. The red is oxygen, and the two white atoms are hydrogen. That's H2O. Water molecules are always moving. When we add heat, they move faster. And if we add enough heat, they'll spread out, and they'll form a gas. We call that gas water vapor. Note that there's nothing between the atoms here. The black is empty space. To understand why bubbles form during boiling, imagine a group of water molecules, and as you add heat, some of them spread out and form a gas, water vapor. When they spread out, they push the molecules around them away, and that forms the bubble that you see. That bubble rises to the surface, that's boiling. Remember, there are only water molecules in those bubbles. They're very energetic water molecules in the form of a gas, which we call water vapor. Boiling depends on the amount of pressure around the liquid. On Earth, the atmosphere is what creates this pressure. If we look at a cross-section of the atmosphere, only 50 kilometers has enough air for humans to breathe. The pressure also decreases as we go higher. That's because as we go higher in the atmosphere, there are fewer air molecules. Like all matter, air has mass, and gravity pulls it towards Earth. That's why the atmosphere doesn't just drift away into outer space. The weight of the air above us pushes down due to gravity, and this creates atmospheric pressure. The more air above you, the more pressure, and pressure makes it more difficult for boiling to take place. Think of it like these books. The more books, the more pressure, and the more pressure, well, eventually, it'll crush the can. When you go up a mountain, there is less air above you pushing down, and the pressure is lower. Your ears can pop, and water boils at a lower temperature than it would at sea level. So back to boiling. Boiling happens when water molecules have enough energy to spread out and to form bubbles. These bubbles rise to the surface, and they release the water vapor. Since the water vapor contains these more energetic molecules, releasing them into the air cools the water. So here we have our beaker with a bubble. If we increase the pressure, the molecules in the bubble will move closer together, and eventually they'll change back into liquid water. Alternatively, if we decrease the pressure, that makes it easier for those water molecules to spread out and form a bubble, and that's boiling. We can see this with the syringe. We push in the plunger, we increase the pressure, molecules move closer together, and the bubble becomes smaller. When we pull the plunger out, we're decreasing the pressure. That means those molecules can spread out more easily and the bubble grows. 
If we pull the plunger out and decrease the pressure enough, water will start boiling. Note that the temperature doesn't change. It doesn't get hotter when it boils. It's just that there's low pressure, the molecules can spread out to form bubbles, and that's what we see happening here. Boiling is strongly influenced by the atmospheric pressure. On Earth, that pressure is created by gravity pulling air molecules down towards Earth. Those air molecules push on a liquid and they can make it more difficult for boiling to take place. Remove the pressure and it's easier for boiling to take place as the more energetic molecules spread out and form bubbles. Note that we haven't talked about the pressure created by molecules of water escaping the liquid. That's called vapor pressure in the subject of the next video. We know that boiling is strongly influenced by atmospheric pressure. Pulled down by gravity, the air above us creates pressure and that makes it difficult for bubbles to form and boiling to take place. We can think of atmospheric pressure as the collisions of air molecules against the surface of the water. That's the pressure. The more collisions, the greater the pressure. But water molecules can create pressure when they leave the liquid. As these faster moving water molecules escape, they collide with the molecules of air. This creates pressure, and we call it vapor pressure. In a way, the water molecules are pushing or colliding against the air molecules. This reduces the amount of pressure felt by the water. Back to boiling. Textbooks often state that when the vapor pressure equals the atmospheric pressure, boiling takes place. This is called the boiling point. Think of it this way. Atmospheric pressure pushes down, and that makes it difficult for the water molecules to spread out and form a bubble. But when the vapor pressure increases, molecules from the liquid escape and they push against the air molecules and effectively reduce some of the pressure. This makes it easier for the liquid molecules to spread out, form a gas, and to rise to the surface. That's boiling. We can make boiling happen by either increasing the vapor pressure or decreasing the atmospheric pressure. Either way, once the vapor pressure and the atmospheric pressure are equal, we've reached the boiling point and boiling can begin. One last thing. Different substances have different vapor pressures and therefore they have different boiling points. This has to do with how strongly the molecules are attracted to each other in the liquid. The more strongly they're attracted, the less the vapor pressure and it's more difficult to boil. Therefore, the higher the boiling point. All right, let's get back to this document. Two new concepts, volatile versus non-volatile. Liquids that vaporize easily are volatile. For example, rubbing alcohol, ethanol, and even water is usually considered volatile, even uh, with a, a little bit higher boiling point and um, uh, liquids that do not vaporize easily are non-volatile, for example, vegetable oil, motor oil. So what you can do is you can put one drop of rubbing alcohol uh, on your hand, and then one drop of vegetable oil on the other hand. And you'll see uh, rubbing alcohol is going to vaporize within three minutes. Uh, the vegetable oil um, probably will take three days to completely um, Vaporize. Volatile liquids have lower boiling point than, than non-volatile liquids. Uh, for example, if we have the same pressure, let's say one ATM pressure, water has a higher boiling point than rubbing alcohol, therefore water is less volatile than rubbing alcohol. Water has a lower boiling point than vegetable oil, and we say water is more volatile than vegetable oil. Again, vaporization is the transition from liquid to gas. To convert liquid to gas, we will have to break the intermolecular attraction between the liquid molecules. That takes energy. And that energy is called enthalpy of vaporization, assuming the vaporization takes place under the constant pressure. Now let's look at this picture of evaporation of water in a closed container. So over here this is water 
let's say in this container A, there's no other gas, and water starts to evaporate, and we have more and more water molecules in the gas phase. And then at point B, all those orange molecules are in the gas state. All those blue molecules are in the liquid state, or just left the liquid state. What about the green molecules? The green molecules are the water molecules in the gas phase, but they are about to return to the liquid phase. So if we give this system a long time period to reach equilibrium, eventually the vaporization rate will be equal to the condensation rate. So what is condensation? A condensation is simply the transition from the gas state to the liquid or solid state. In this case, condensation refers to the transition from the gas state to the liquid state. So these four green molecules are about to return to the liquid state. These four blue molecules are about to evaporate from the liquid state to the gas state. So overall, you can see the evaporation rate and the condensation rate eventually will be the same. We call that dynamic equilibrium. Why dynamic? It means still something is going on. Both evaporation and condensation are going on. It's just the rate of evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. So all or we don't see any net change. Now let's look at another uh, diagram here. So over here, again, let's say we have uh, water in the liquid state, in gas state, let's say they reach equilibrium, then the condensation rate is equal to the evaporation rate. Now let's try to heat up the liquid state. That will increase the evaporation rate. We just break the equilibrium. Now the evaporation rate is greater than the condensation rate. Overall, we're going to see the increase of the vapor pressure of water in the gas phase. And you can see there are more water molecules in this container than in this one. When the vapor pressure of a liquid reaches the external pressure, then uh, this liquid can form bubbles inside against this external pressure. The bubbles will rise above and then disappear into the gas state. And we say the liquid is boiling. So you can see this external pressure is very important. That's why if we try to boil water on top of Mount Everest, because the pressure is lower over there, that means it's easier for water to form bubble against a lower external pressure, thus a lower boiling point. Uh, this is a qualitative analysis, so somehow we can use the so-called clausius Clapeyron equation to make a lot of quantitative predictions about the boiling point, about the vapor pressure, and about the enthalpy of vaporization. If you do control click, uh, you will see a video I made for my physical chemistry students. So uh, if you are interested How in does the, vapor uh, pressure of a pure liquid depend on the chemistry major, I think it's uh, uh, How does probably a uh, good idea for you to just you know take a look at this. You know, this is only a uh, five-minute video. Reactions. Uh, again, this is for uh, physical chemistry students, chemistry 3 in one class. All right, get back to the document here. Um, I'm not going to derive this equation here because, again, you will have to learn more uh, calculus and physics before you can uh, understand or derive this equation. So for this course, we'll just be able to use this equation. That's good enough. Uh, this is the vapor, uh, vapor pressure here. The natural logarithm of the vapor pressure on top of a liquid is equal to negative. Uh, this is enthalpy of vaporization, and this is R, the gas constant, times 1 over the temperature um, plus a constant. So by looking at this equation, you probably realize that we can make a linear plot. 
just imagine the logarithm of p uh, vaporization this vapor pressure imagine this is your y 1 over the temperature this is your x this is your slope m the constant is the intercept b so just imagine you're looking at y equals m times x plus b so if we again plot this uh, natural logarithm of the vapor pressure as our uh, vertical axis 1 over the temperature is our horizontal axis uh, again we're gonna get a linear plot with a slope this is the slope so how can we uh, get the enthalpy of va vaporization we simply again uh, need to collect some data about the temperature and vapor pressure as long as we have two or more data points we can make such plot and then get the slope and the slope multiplied by negative r that will give us the enthalpy of vaporization so i'm going to show you an example here let's say we uh, know the vapor pressure of water at three different temperatures uh, what temperatures 0 0.01 degrees celsius so that's fairly low temperature 25 degrees celsius uh, this is uh, i think 77 degree fahrenheit and 100 uh, degrees Celsius. So that's the uh, boiling point of water under 180 m pressure. And what's the uh, water vapor pressure at each of the three temperature? Uh, I give you these three numbers here in ATM. So make sure that you know 180 m is equal to uh, 101,325 pascals. So I'm going to show you the Excel plot I made first, and then I'll show you how to make it. Uh, we need a Excel plot with this LMP as the y-axis. 1 over temperature is the x-axis. And then the reason I say P over 1 ATM is because it is wise not to take the logarithm of a unit. So if I ask you what's uh, log, uh, the natural logarithm of uh, 1 ATM, you probably want to answer it's zero, but uh, 1 ATM is uh, 101,325 uh, 101, pascals. And then if I ask you uh, what's the logarithm of 101,325 pascals, and then you get stuck because uh, I'm telling you the same pressure just in different units. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to get rid of the unit before taking the logarithm. So we have three data points. They are labeled. So this zero means the logarithm is zero. And this is the one ATM data. So one ATM over one ATM, that's one logarithm of one is just zero. Uh, what about this number? This number is the reciprocal of the temperature. And make sure that you use Kelvin as the unit for the temperature. And for this one over T, the unit is one over Kelvin. And then this is another data point here. The third data point here and you can see 1 over t increases from left to right therefore well you know the temperature uh, decreases from left to right uh, this is uh, 100 degrees Celsius this is 25 degrees Celsius and this is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius again you make uh, this data plot you do a linear regression you get the slope again this slope multiplied by negative r is the enthalpy of vaporization now I'm going to show you how to do that again this is the Excel plot so what you want to do is first you want to tabulate the temperature and vapor pressure the pressure is in ATM right now temperature is in degrees Celsius what you want to do is you convert degrees Celsius to Kelvin first and then the, your X axis or horizontal axis is 1 over temperature what about your Y axis or vertical axis that's the logarithm of P over 1 ATM. And then you see negative numbers here because these two numbers are less than 1. And then after you do that, you select the data and then you do insert and uh, over here scattered and then you can make a data plot. And then somehow you need to kind of just add the axis labels, add the linear equation, etc., etc. And then you'll get the slope. After you get the slope, the slope 
uh, multiply by negative r, you will get the enthalpy of vaporization. So I'm going to show you the whole calculation step by step over here. So right now I have entered the uh, vapor pressure at different temperatures. I got three different temperatures. At 100 degrees Celsius, um, the water vapor pressure is 1 atm. And also under 1 atm, the boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. Same thing. And similar here, at 25 degrees Celsius, the water vapor pressure is 0 0.0313 atm. So that means if the external pressure is 0 0.0313 atm, then water can boil at 25 degrees Celsius. And actually, in uh, physical chemistry labs, I always do a demonstration for my students to see water can boil at actually 20 degrees Celsius. And I ask my students to touch the boiling water. And they felt really cold temperature over there. It can be 20, it can be 15, depending on how low the external pressure can be. Uh, what about uh, the uh, boiling point of water when the external pressure is only 0 0.006 atm? Then the boiling point of water is 0 0.01 degrees Celsius, just a little bit higher than the freezing point of water under 1 atm. So this is really interesting. Again, you can boil water at 0 0.01 degrees Celsius as long as the external pressure is low enough. Now we have these three data points. First, I need to convert degree Celsius to Kelvin. You know how to do that. It's the degree Celsius plus 273.15. Um, we got the uh, uh, temperature in Kelvin, and I'm going to drag this down here. I got three other temperatures. And then 1 over temperature equals 1 divided by, I'm going to click this cell, C3. So I got this reciprocal of temperature and I drag it down I got three more numbers the natural logarithm of P over 1 atm is simply the logarithm of this numerical value so I'm just trying to get rid of the unit here all right it's a negative number because this numerical value is less than one okay so I will click the bottom right corner there's a small square, field square there. I'm going to click that and drag it down. I got three data points. Now I have, um, again, three data points are do insert scattered uh, chart over here. So I got the three data points. It doesn't look very pretty, but first I'm going to make this plot bigger so that you can see everything. And then I'm going to make the font size bigger. I'm doing Ctrl A to select all, and then I'm going to use font size 20 okay this is uh, pretty big I'm gonna use bold font I'm gonna use black so this is good enough and also you can see the three data points here so we're not using the space efficiently so I'm gonna change this uh, axis maybe to 2.5 uh, nope the minimum should be all right so this is better now we have three data points over here uh, and then I'm gonna display the uh, linear equation so we do a plus uh, we're gonna do a trend line and over here we're gonna display the equation down there display equation display r squared value so this r squared is very close to one that means very good fitting, and we have the slope, and we have the, the intercept. Don't worry about the meaning of the intercept yet until you take physical chemistry. Let's look at the slope. This slope multiplied by R, the gas constant, 8.31446 joule per mole K, you get the enthalpy of vaporization. So, uh, and of course, we need to kind of just uh, add the uh, uh, axis titles, I'm going to change the title of uh, this uh, graph. So this is going to be 1 over T. The unit is 1 over Kelvin. I want to specify the uh, vertical axis as well. Um, I'm being lazy here. I'm going to just type LMP. It's actually LMP divided by 1 ATM. And uh, the most important thing here is uh, this slope. 
the slope is uh, negative uh, 5197 here. What's the unit of the slope? The unit of the slope is Kelvin. The reason is the vertical axis has no unit. The horizontal axis has a unit of 1 over k. So a number divided by you know another number in 1 over k is k. So maybe I should uh, just be more kind of just uh, diligent ATM here. So this is just to remind you we're not taking the logarithm of 1 ATM. We're taking the logarithm of 1. Uh, so this 1 ATM divided by 1 ATM is 1. We're dividing this 0 0.03 ATM by 1 ATM to get a numerical value of the pressure. So again, do not take the logarithm of a unit. So now we have the slope. The slope is negative uh, 5197. Uh, and also there's another way to get a slope without making any graph. So it just equals slope. If you are familiar with Excel, you know this function already. And then what you need to do is you just highlight the Y value. I am holding down the um, control button. This is my value. And then followed by a comma and then 3x value, and then uh, the right parenthesis. OK, I got the same slope. So really, you don't even need to make the graph to get the slope. What's the enthalpy of uh, uh, the vaporization? Uh, that's just the slope. The slope times, OK, this is very important. Negative r. It's not r. It's negative r. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to enter negative ideal constant, which is 8.31446 joule per mole. In Excel, you can't enter the unit. It's not going to do the calculation if you enter the unit. So I'm just doing some numerical calculation here. But I know the unit is joule per mole because I was using um, as a unit here. Uh, this is joule per mole. Um, we can convert it to kilojoule per mole, which is simply joule per mole divided by 1,000. All right, so now we have the enthalpy of vaporization of water which is 43 kilojoule per mole. Uh, we can also use, you know, two other data points uh, to do hand calculation. Let's say uh, we can use this two data points to do hand calculation to get the enthalpy of vaporization. We can also use uh, this two, or maybe the first and third one to do hand calculation without making the uh, Excel plot. Without using the Excel slope function, we can also uh, do hand calculation to get the enthalpy of vaporization, but uh, I'll get back to this a little bit later. Uh, so over here, again, you see this uh, data plot in my Word document file. Again, both the Word document and the Excel plot are uploaded to Canvas for you to use. Uh, this is the uh, Clausius clay payload equation again. What's the y-axis? Natural logarithm of the vapor pressure. What's the horizontal axis? 1 over the temperature. What's the slope? Negative enthalpy of vaporization divided by r. What's the intercept? The intercept is a constant. Uh, in the textbook and some other textbooks, they don't usually put this molar here. But when I put molar here, I just want to remind you the unit is going to be joule per mole or kilojoule per mole. We're talking about one mole water. And this R is the gas constant. Gas constant is 8.31446 joule per mole per Kelvin. Or if you use some other units, it's 0 0.08206 ATM liter uh, per mole per Kelvin. So anyway, uh, if you can use the SI units, just you know, use the SI units. That will save uh, your time. Now, let's look at this uh, clausius clay payton equation again. I'm going to use this equation for temperature 1. I got this equation. At temperature 1, I got this vapor pressure 1. And I'm going to use the same equation for a different temperature, temperature 2. At temperature 2, I got uh, vapor pressure 2. So I got two equations, uh, one at temperature 1, the other equation at temperature 2. So why did I do that? Well, I want to actually use equation 2 minus equation 1. This is to get rid of this constant, because I don't know what the constant is. But if I do equation 2 minus equation 1, I can get rid of the constant. 
How do we take the difference between two equations? Very simple. The left hand side minus the left hand side and the right hand side minus the right hand side. So we have this equation. The left hand side minus the left hand side. Now the right hand side minus the right hand side. If you look at this term and this term, they share a common factor. Negative delta h over r. So over here, negative delta h over r. And then I have just 1 over t2 minus 1 over t1. Right? So you may find this VAP, 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 VAP tedious here. I just want to remind you we're talking about vaporization. Because later, actually, you can use exactly the same equation for sublimation. The transition from the solid phase to the gas phase. All right? So now we are going to combine these two terms. Remember, ln y minus ln x is ln y over x. Okay? ln 6 minus ln 3 is ln 6 over 3. That's ln 2. So make sure you understand how to do logarithms. So over here. And I just copied the right hand side here. So this equation tells us if we have the vapor pressure at temperature 1 and vapor pressure at temperature 2. So we know this P2, P1, T2, T1. And then we can hand calculate this enthalpy of vaporization. Let's get back to the Excel. Oh, here, this is my Excel. Now I'm going to use two data points to hand calculate the enthalpy of vaporization. So two data points at 25 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius, this two. So what I will do is I will take the uh, ratio between these two. Okay, and then I'll take the logarithm of that. And then I'm going to divide that, you know, by what? By the difference between 1 over t. So fortunately, I got those L and P here. I got 1 over t here. So over here, I'm going to do this. L and P2 over P1. L and P2 over P1. That's on top. And then divided by 1 over T2. So this guy. Minus 1 over T1, this guy. All right? And then we get a negative number. This is not the enthalpy of vaporization. Remember, when we do ln P2 over P1, divided by 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1, we will get negative enthalpy of vaporization divided by R. So we need to multiply the number we just got by negative R. So over here, I'm going to just do this. We're not done yet. Times negative R. R is the gas constant. Its value is 8.31446 joule per mole Kelvin. You can Google this number. Just Google ideal gas constant. All right, and we're not done yet. This is a big number, uh, so people usually use kilojoule per mole instead. All right, you got 42.7 kilojoule per mole. This is the enthalpy of vaporization using two data points at 25 degrees Celsius and 100 degrees Celsius. You may wonder why this number is slightly different from this number. Actually, the enthalpy of vaporization depends on the temperature a little bit. Usually the higher the temperature, the lower the enthalpy of vaporization. The lower the temperature, the higher, the greater the enthalpy of the vaporization. At 100 degrees Celsius, I think the enthalpy of vaporization of water is 40.7 uh, kilojoule per mole. At 25 degrees Celsius, it's 44 kilojoule per mole. So you can see the difference from 25 to 100 degrees Celsius. The enthalpy of vaporization changes from 44 to 40.7 kilojoule per mole. So uh, now let's use two other data points to do uh, the hand calculation of the enthalpy of vaporization. Again, equal sign. What I will do is I will do uh, LNP2 minus LNP1 here. So this guy minus this guy. Okay, again, LMP2 minus LMP1 is equal to LMP2 over P1. That's just a simple logarithm operation. 
divided by the difference between these two reciprocal. So this guy minus this guy. Right? Again, it's a negative number because we need to multiply this by the gas constant over here. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I think I used the wrong data. Over here, I wanted to use zero degree data. So I'm going to make a little bit change here. Cell E3, that's zero degree Celsius data. Okay. So you see, uh, we got this uh, number in joule per mole, and then this number divided by 1,000. We got 43.3 uh, kilojoule per mole. So on average, the enthalpy of vaporization between 0 and 100 degrees Celsius is 43.3 kilojoule per mole. Again, the lower the temperature, the greater the enthalpy of vaporization. All right, so let's get back to the document. Before we do that, I want to show you this uh, practice Excel sheet. So um, I think you can just fill in all those blanks yourself, make the uh, data plot, get the slope, put it in here, and you can use the slope function to get the slope as well. Uh, let me show you how to do that. Over here, you need to enter the uh, select the values of Y and then comma and then select the value of x and then you will get the slope without uh, making the data plot and then uh, the slope is going to be negative you multiply the slope by negative r you will get the enthalpy of vaporization in joule per mole and then divided by 1000 you get kilojoule per mole so let's get back to the document again so in this document again if you use this equation we can calculate the enthalpy of vaporization by hand, given only two data points. Uh, finally, the last paragraph of this video, uh, I'll talk about supercritical fluid. So what is this? Uh, a supercritical fluid is both a liquid and a gas. It's neither a liquid nor a gas. Uh, so if we... Um, uh, have a high enough external pressure a liquid can never uh, turn into gas I mean even for water or for some other liquid somehow if you just apply high enough pressure let's say 1000 bars pressure or 1000 ATM pressure to water water will never boil it's gonna turn into a so-called supercritical fluid um, so somehow you can understand Super uh, a supercritical fluid as a overcompressed gas and overheated liquid at the same time. All right, the density of a supercritical fluid is roughly ten percent to sixty percent of the liquid density, or you know several hundred times the gas density. So it seems like this supercritical fluid is kind of close to a liquid regarding density, but a supercritical fluid does not have a definite volume so that make it look like uh, more like a gas uh, why is this uh, supercritical fluid useful one example is this if we have co2 okay it's a gas right so if we um, lower its temperature to uh, 31 degrees celsius and increase the pressure to um, uh, anyway, if we have uh, the temperature at uh, 31 degrees Celsius or higher and a pressure of 73 atm or higher, uh, we will be able to make this so-called CO2 supercritical fluid. And this fluid can extract caffeine from coffee beans without affecting any other uh, chemicals inside the beans. And then uh, you have uh, decaffed coffee beans. And a CO2 supercritical fluid is often used as organic, uh, is often used as a solvent for organic chemical reactions as well. So that's why this is very useful. Can you make water supercritical fluid? Yes, you can, of course. But you need a very high temperature. The boiling point of water is 100 degrees Celsius. I think you need 400 degrees Celsius temperature and several hundred bars pressure to make uh, water supercritical fluid. Now let's look at some uh, practice problems, uh, five of them. First, what's the uh, water vapor pressure at uh, 98.6 uh, 
uh, degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, this is actually 37 degrees Celsius. I just want you to know um, it's important to pay attention to the unit. Uh, second question. At 20 degrees Celsius, I give you the vapor pressure of ethanol. At a different temperature, uh, I also give you a, a vapor pressure here. And you can see as temperature goes up, see, from 20 to 63.5, as temperature goes up, the vapor pressure goes up. So I want you to compute its uh, enthalpy of vaporization. Okay, for ethanol. Uh, number three, uh, given the information from uh, the previous question, uh, the second question, you can calculate the normal boiling point of ethanol. So what does this normal boiling point mean? Normal means uh, 1 atm pressure. Uh, there's another concept or definition, the standard boiling point. That's the boiling point under 1, one bar pressure. That's the standard boiling point. Again, uh, the UPAC definition for the standard state is one bar. Okay, that's the UPAC definition, but in some uh, general chemistry textbooks, um, the authors are still using the obsolete um, definition of the standard state. Uh, I think it was 1 ATM before 1982. Okay, and uh, I think today it's 2020, year 2020. So anyway, uh, number four, when a liquid reaches equilibrium with with its wave vapor, okay, it's called a dynamic equilibrium. So what does this mean? Again, this means the evaporation of the liquid and the condensation of the vapor are going on at the same time. The rate of the evaporation is equal to the rate of condensation. So overall, there's no net change. When the liquid reaches equilibrium with its vapor, um, the vapor pressure will not change. Unless you change the condition, unless you heat it up or do some other things. Okay, now I'm going to do something weird. I'm going to cover half of the liquid surface with a parafilm. Or uh, if you have food wrap, you can you can use that as well at home. At home. So just anything that covers half of the surface of the liquid. So what do you think will happen to this equilibrium? What will happen to the water vapor pressure? Oh, uh, will that go down or that go up? Uh, question number five. I'm going to uh, add some other liquid into a pure liquid. So again, when the pure liquid reaches equilibrium with its vapor, we call that equilibrium. And then we're going to add some other liquid in this uh, first liquid. We're going to dilute this pure liquid uh, to maybe just 50% more fraction. All right, what will happen to the equilibrium between the liquid and the gas? What will happen to the vapor pressure? So I'm going to talk about the answers here, the analysis here in this video. So, but I highly recommend you to um, kind of just pause the video, uh, take a look at the uh, five questions. So for example, you can pause right here. Think about questions one, two, three, and then pause it here. Think about uh, questions four and five before you continue watch the video. All right, but anyway, I'm going to provide you the answer here. The answer is here. What's the water vapor pressure at 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit? The answer is 0 0.0639 atm. I'm going to show you how I did this problem. I did not do the calculation myself. I used this website, Wolfram Alpha. So I'm going to do control click to take you to this website. All right. And I'm going to make it a little bigger. And you can see I just typed up this equation here. And then I click this equal sign. Wolfram Alpha calculates this equation for me. So again, I need to have LMP2 over P1. Right, two different vapor pressures. I do know the vapor pressure of water is one atm, so I put one atm here. Uh, at one hundred degrees Celsius, so I put one hundred degrees Celsius here. You may ask, it's not one hundred. Well, it is one hundred degrees Celsius, or three hundred seventy-three point one five Kelvin. When you are using this clausius clapeyron equation, make sure. You always use Kelvin. 
as the unit of temperature. So this is 1 over T1, and over here, this is P2 over P1. Okay, since I have only one variable, I'm going to say this variable is just P. Negative, all right, negative enthalpy of vaporization in the SI unit. Um, this enthalpy of vaporization does depend on temperature. It's uh, 40.7 at 100 degrees Celsius. It's 44 kilojoule per mole at 25 degrees Celsius. So I just used the number in between. Uh, I used 42 kilojoule per mole here. And again, 42 kilojoule per mole is 42,000 joule per mole. So again, I'm using joule per mole here. Uh, this is the gas constant. Again, you can just uh, look up this value on the internet. And then this is 1 over 37 degrees Celsius. I converted 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit to degrees Celsius. That's 37, the normal body temperature of a human being. And then plus 273. So over, over here, you're looking at 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Over here, you're looking at ln P2 over P1. And this is negative enthalpy of vaporization over R. All right, again, I mean, if you just uh, click this equal sign, well, from alpha, we'll compute this equation. It will show you this equation in a more clear format here. So T2, 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. Over here, logarithm of P2 over P1. Over here, this is negative enthalpy of vaporization over. So again, if you uh, scroll down, you will get the pressure in ATM because I used ATM for this number one here. This is one ATM. Therefore, this P should be in ATM. 0 0.0639 ATM, that's the answer. Again, I'm gonna show you this equal sign here. Uh, Wolfram Alpha is thinking, and then you get the answer here. All right, so get back to this. This is the answer, 0 0.0639 ATM. This is higher than the water vapor pressure at 25 degrees Celsius because this is a higher 37 degrees Celsius. Now, I'm gonna ask you to compute the enthalpy of vaporization of ethanol by giving you two data points. The first data point, 20 degrees Celsius. The vapor pressure is 5.95 kilopascal, okay? At a higher temperature, 63.5 degrees Celsius. The vapor pressure is higher, 53.3 kilopascal. Now let's compute the enthalpy of vaporization. The answer is here, but I'm going to show you Wolfram, Wolfram Alpha again. Wolfram Alpha, I type it up the equation. This time, the only variable is enthalpy of vaporization. So this is my LMP2 over P1. Okay, make sure you use the same unit for these two numbers. Okay, so this number is in kilopascal. This number is also in kilopascal. So these two units may cancel. And then how about this part? This part is 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. My temperature 1 is 20 degrees Celsius. All right, convert this to Kelvin, please. And then my T2 is 63.5 degrees Celsius. Convert it to Kelvin, please. And then this is 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. If you're not sure, use many pairs of parentheses. And then what's the slope? Or what's the coefficient in front of 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1? It's negative enthalpy of vaporization over R. All right, so I'm just lazy. I'm just putting X here. X is my enthalpy of vaporization in the SI unit. So let's look at the answer here. Oh, first, this is the expression of the Clausius Clay-Palon equation. The natural logarithm of P2 over P1 equals negative enthalpy of vaporization over R, the gas constant, times 1 over T2 in Kelvin minus 1 over T1 in Kelvin. And then the answer is over here, okay, 41 kilo joule per mole. Uh, this number is in joule per mole because both joule and mole are the SI units. Kilojoule is not an SI unit, but why do we always say kilojoule per mole for enthalpy of vaporization? Because this number is pretty big. It's easier to say 41 kilojoule per mole than 41,000 joule per mole. So anyway, the answer is 41.36 kilojoule per mole. 
And I want to show you how to do the calculation. You type this up, you click equal sign, and Wolfram Alpha will produce the result in a second. All right, get back to this. This is my answer over here. Pay attention to the unit. This is kilojoule. All right. Uh, given the information from this question, calculate the normal boiling point of ethanol. The answer is 78.8 degrees Celsius. So how can we do that? Look, we just need to use this information, enthalpy of vaporization, to get the normal boiling point of ethanol. All right, so when the external pressure is 1 atm, we need to heat up this liquid ethanol so that its vapor pressure reaches 1 atm. So the question is simple. At what temperature will the vapor pressure of ethanol reach 1 atm? All right, we have this uh, enthalpy of vaporization here. And then we can either use this data point or use this data point, either one, or do the calculation. Now I'm going to click Wolfram off again uh, and show you this uh, Clapeyron, uh, Clausius Clapeyron equation. Okay, so you type this up in this text box. You click this equal sign, you will get the result. But I want to show you this format. This is a better format. Uh, this LEG, LOG log, this is actually natural logarithm, okay, in Wolfram Alpha. P2 over P1. My P1 is 1 atm. Okay. Uh, this is the normal pressure. 1 atm pressure is equal to 101, 325 pascals. So if you uh, are curious, again, you can just Google all these numbers uh, from the internet or you can find them in your textbook. And I'm going to use actually the data point at uh, 63.5 degrees Celsius. The uh, vapor pressure is 53.3 kilo pascal. So this is uh, 53,300 pascal on top. And this is uh, in degrees Celsius. I convert it to Kelvin. And then 1 over T2 minus 1 over T1. This is logarithm of P2 over P1, both in pascals. So make sure you use the same unit for both vapor pressures. Over here, this is negative enthalpy of vaporization over R. How do I get this? This is from question two. All right, and then I just click equal sign. You will get uh, 78.8 over here. And um, you should understand the unit for this should be degree Celsius because uh, when I define this variable T, I'm using T plus 273 here. Therefore, T by itself is in degree Celsius. T plus 273 is in Kelvin. So again, I just got the uh, boiling point of ethanol in degree Celsius. All right, question four. Uh, when a liquid reaches equilibrium with its vapor, what will happen if we cover half of the liquid surface? Nothing will happen. It's kind of strange, but um, if you cover half of the liquid surface, you will reduce the condensation rate and the evaporation rate simultaneously by uh, the same percentage, 50%. So it is still an equilibrium. And I want to uh, emphasize that this is a um, dynamic equilibrium. So both condensation and evaporation are going on. It's just the rate of con condensation is equal to the rate of evaporation. After you cover half of the liquid surface, both rates are reduced by 50%. Okay, question five. When a liquid A reaches equilibrium with its vapor, now I'm going to add another liquid B into A. So what will happen to this equilibrium? Okay, if we add B to A, just imagine, you know, 50%, 50%, let's say, now I have uh, uh, 50 molecules of A and 50 molecules of B uh, in the beaker. On the surface now, you're not going to have the same number of A's on the surface. You're going to have only half of the number of uh, A molecules this time. All right, that will reduce the evaporation rate by 50%. 
okay? Because again, only surface molecules can evaporate, okay? The molecules inside the liquid cannot evaporate. So by adding B to A, you reduce the number of uh, surface molecules of A by 50%, and then you reduce the evaporation rate. What about the condensation rate? There's no effect because for condensation to happen, well, you still have the entire surface, entire liquid surface for condensation to happen. So the condensation rate remains unchanged. Therefore, there's no longer equilibrium. The condensation rate is twice the evaporation rate after you dilute A to 50%. And therefore, the vapor pressure of A will decrease to 50% of its initial value.